couple of weeks ago when we were together on Sunday evening, we were looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which is often called the love chapter. And Paul was trying to correct a lot of things that were going on in that church at Corinth. Some of it had to do with personal conflict and some of it had to do with the church as a whole when they met together to worship. And at other times it had to do with their morality and things that they were doing and things that they were tolerating in the church. So there was a lot of things that were going on. And so kind of in the middle, obviously, of chapter 12 and chapter 14, where he is talking about things that happen in worship and the attitudes and the actions that we would have towards each other, that would also be reflective of maybe our relationship with God. The, the more we're connected with God, the more we're going to have his characteristics in our life. But 1 Corinthians 13 is a chapter of love. And so if we've been studying the Bible or we'd mentioned maybe if he'd even been to a wedding, that may be a, a scripture that people uh, would read. And I don't know, maybe that's appropriate because some people's marriage maybe does look like 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and chapter 14, you know, where there's a lot of problems and division and fussing and, you know, people want to get ahead and people want to look good or whatever. So, by the way, that was supposed to be funny, but that's okay. Um, but uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is a chapter of love. And so the introduction of it was just the first few verses that kind of say how important love is and we can do a lot of good things and maybe even do good things with the wrong motives or we can do good things with the right motives but doesn't always end up maybe as we'd hoped but here he does describe qualities of love so that's what i want to talk about tonight and actually we're not going to talk about all the qualities of love we're going to go through one at a time because i'm thinking that may be helpful if we kind of get specific uh, as we talk about what it would look like to be a person of love or develop these attributes or the attitudes of love. So uh, last time the, the theme was on love verbs of how love is action. Love is something you do. Love is something you express. It's really not something you say. Hopefully when you say it, it comes from what you really believe or how you're really acting. So I'm not telling the men here, you know, you don't need to start or you don't need to stop telling your wife you love them because, you know, some women feel like my husband hardly tells me now. The preacher says he doesn't have to tell me at all. That's not what I'm saying, but you know what I'm saying, that just to say I love you and you don't love them in your actions or in your attitudes and the way you live, that's, that's not really that helpful, and that is sometimes hypocritical, and maybe that's why some people have a hard time saying I love you, because like if you don't see it, then maybe I don't, and why should I have to say it if I can demonstrate it and you can actually see it and you should be able to sense my love and feel my love and see my love. I shouldn't always have to verbalize it. But what does this love look like? So the first one that comes on the list here in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians is patience. And so that's the beginning. So we're going to look at this first section anyway. We're not going to go through them all, as I said. But it says, love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. But the first thing that he says is love is patient. I guess as I was thinking about what Paul is writing here, I don't know if he is emphasizing some things that the church needs to hear, okay? So he's not necessarily trying to come up with an exhaustive list of what look, love looks like. Does that make sense? So if you are a parent and you're trying to raise some children, and let's say the children are not getting along very well, you may say to your children, listen kids, you need to love each other, and, and when you love each other, you're going to be kind, and you're going to share. Could you see a parent saying that to, to a child? But does the child then think, if I am kind and I share, that's all love is? No, that's not what the parents are trying to say. But in this moment, that's how love would be expressed. Does that make sense? So I think when Paul comes up with this list, it's not necessarily saying this is all there is to love, but for the Corinthian problem and the issues and the struggles they're going through, this is, this is what you need to be working on. When we talk about the umbrella of all the things love could be, these are some areas that you're weak in. These are areas you need to grow in. So let's talk with, you know, love is patient. So again, another challenge that sometimes I have in reading a list is, is the list in some kind of an order? Who decided patient was going to, why not kindness? Why not forgiveness? Why is that not number one? And there may be no reason. It may be a, a random, does that make sense, a list? There, there's no importance of, you know, like am I saying maybe 
this patience is the thing that there's, they need to be working on the most and the other things will fall into place if they can only learn to be more patient? Maybe, maybe not. So I'm not, not saying it is a list, but maybe, maybe it's not just coincidental that patience is the first one. So let me look at another list, and I think this list is a little bit more con uh, uh, inclusive. In other words, it, it puts everything together, and that's the one in Galatians chapter 5, because I don't think at this point when Paul's writing in Galatians 5, he's necessarily trying to correct anything, right? He's not trying to say, you guys are so messed up with all your infighting, this is a list that you guys need to work off of. I think Paul at this point is just saying, this is what the fruit of the Spirit looks like. If you're living in the Spirit, these are the attributes. And so he is not speaking to a specific problem, and so he is more including all the different areas. And again, you know, I'm sure someone could think, well, there is another attribute you could have if you're a spiritual person. It's not on the list. So, we're, you know, we're not trying to say there, there is not anything else, but I think this is more inclusive. So the interesting thing is, is that some people, and you know, I don't know exactly how all the studies went, they look at the list and they say to their congregation, here's a list, what is it that maybe is an individual that you would say, this is, this is an area that I struggle with in my life. You know, so we're not talking about when we're at church, what are we struggling with, but you know, when I'm at work or when I'm at the store or I'm with my family or I'm on the highway or whatever, you know, wherever you are, what is the one? What's the thing that you, you struggle with? And a lot of people seem to say, patience. So I don't know, when you look over the list, you know, and obviously we're at different points in our life and maybe you're good with patience and you're not so good with, uh, you know, maybe faithfulness or joy or something. But sometimes this idea of, of being patient, what that looks like. And so I think it would be helpful for maybe us, for us at this point to look at some scriptures that talk about what it is to be patient and what we're called to do and, and maybe what patience looks like. So we'll look at a few scriptures. One is, is in Ephesians chapter 4. And here uh, Paul is writing to the church. And, and again, he's kind of emphasizing the church unity, the unity in the spirit and the bond of peace. Uh, he goes on to talk about uh, the oneness that we have in Christ, the seven ones. And then he goes on talking about the body of Christ working together and loving each other and serving one another and, and, and us being the church that God's called us to be. But maybe to get to that point, he says this at the beginning of chapter four, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. So this idea of being patient and so what does being patient mean? Now, some of the older translations, maybe the, the King James, I'm not even sure about the New King James, but the older uh, uses the word long-suffering. You're, you're, you're able to suffer long. You're able to endure a lot. So maybe for some people, they would say it's the difference between having a short fuse and having a long fuse. And the bigger the explosion, the longer fuse would be more helpful. It gives you more time to escape, right? Or maybe to say before this bomb goes off, we would like to, uh, uh, you know, we've got some time to uh, defuse the bomb, right? So having a long fuse, so we don't just kind of blow up at every moment, at every time, at every opportunity, at every skirmish, at every struggle. You know, we are not somebody who's just ready to explode, right? So you, you may know people like that that, you know, they, they either say things or they do things or they're quick to, I think there's even a scripture that talks about quick to brawl. Do not be brawlers. In other words, you know, literally getting into fights. Now, we think about brawling maybe fist fights, but you, you go to jail for that now. I mean, when we were in school, the kids had fist fights all the time, and I don't even know if we went to the principal's office, but um, it's, it's not a good thing to be that kind of a person. You know, people in the sports world sometimes get carried away and they get into fights, uh, you know, or... Maybe people on the, the road or people at work or sometimes even in the home. So that's a part of being patient, of, of having a long fuse saying, I, I, I can go through a lot, I can endure a lot, and, and I don't retaliate. I, I don't get all upset. You know, I don't lose it. I'm able to, uh, another word is self-control. So that's part of what this patience is involved. So the idea, if, if you're patient, you're able to bear with one another. So you recognize that people... They have problems, they have struggles, they have issues, they have questions, they have weaknesses, 
They don't always act like they should. They don't always come through like they promised. They don't always fulfill what you expect of them, right? And so maybe you just kind of, that's a good place to start, right? Like if we just kind of started by saying, when I drive on the road, I realize there's going to be some people that are maniacs, they're in a hurry, they don't care, they're selfish, and they're not nice. Those are the good words I have tonight. All right? You with me? But if we recognize that, then maybe that would help us when we're actually driving on the road and saying, why is he such an idiot? It's like, oh yeah, I forgot. I already told myself there's gonna be a lot of idiots on the road. He's just one of them. So I don't need to get, I don't need to get upset about it. I don't need to lose my cool. I don't need to be mad. It's just like, hey, that's part of life, right? Or maybe there's somebody like that at work that you almost know you're gonna run into. So it's like, well, that's him. That's the way he is. Why should I get all upset and lo lose my composure and, and, and raise my blood pressure and you know, get all worried about it? Just say, hey, you know, I gotta realize that People have weaknesses and people have issues. Maybe there's a lot of reasons. You know, I, I know Judy and I sometimes when we see somebody driving, you know, erratically fast, cutting people off, we think, oh, I'm sure they must be in a hurry because, you know, they probably got to get to the hospital or something, you know. So maybe cut them some slack. You don't know. Maybe they are in a hurry to get to the hospital. So that, that would be justified for them to be that kind of a driver. But give them the benefit of the doubt, perhaps. But bearing with one another. So if we can do that, think, I'm going to bear with other people, then that may help the patients to become a little more real and maybe a little more understandable in our life. In Colossians chapter 3, so again, there's a, uh, the picture here is maybe what some of the people wore in the New Testament times. Because Colossians 3 uses this analogy of our clothing, okay? So Colossians chapter 3 um, at the beginning of the chapter, he, he talks about that we need to have our focus on heaven, that we need to um, set our hearts on things above, things of God, things of the Spirit, set our hearts on things above. He said not on earthly things. But then he goes on to say this in Colossians 3 in verse uh, 8. Now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, malice, rage, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on your new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge in the image of its creator. Okay, so what is he saying there? That these are things we take off. So it's, you know, again, like a dirty garment. You'd say at the end of the day, you know, a lot of people, you know, especially if you work somewhere where it's really dirty, you take your clothes off and you put new clothes on, clean clothes on, because now you're in the house. And some people, um, you know, I hear people do this. Sometimes at the, end of the, at the end of the day when they go to bed, they actually take off their, their street clothes and put on pajamas, right? I don't know. Maybe some people do that. But, now I don't wear my street clothes to bed either, so. But that, this is the idea, that there's certain clothes for a certain occasion. And so now he's saying, take off all these dirty clothes that you've been working in. It's your old way of life. And you don't want to wear these clothes anymore. It's kind of like when we come to church, right? We put on, sometimes our Sunday best, sometimes we don't. But, you know, sometimes we put on our nicer clothes, right? Because that's, that's the occasion. And so he's already said, take off that old stuff, the bad attitudes, the sinful nature, the, the old way we used to live when we were non-Christians. Now we're, now we're Christians. What do we got to do? So if you're taking your old clothes off, you've got to put something else on. That's what he's saying here. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dear loved, clothe yourselves. Put these clothes on, is what he's saying. What do these clothes look like? Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. So all of these seem to work together, don't they? So if, if, if I'm going to have patience, you know, if I have compassion towards other people, I might be a little more patient towards them. If I have kindness, I'm thinking, how, how can I treat this person kindly? Maybe it would help me to have patience. What if I'm more humble? Instead of saying, how dare they do that? To, don't they know who I am? Didn't they see I was here first? Don't they care about my position? Well, maybe I'm in a hurry too. Right? So we can get all kinds of attitudes, but we say, well, I can be humble. If I'm humble, maybe that'll help me to be patient. If I'm gentle, right, instead of 
you know, being mean-spirited, being angry. Maybe I could be gentle. That would help me to be patient. So these attitudes all, I think, work together to be patient. But again, if I'm patient, it's going to be easier for me to be kind. And it's going to be easier for me to be compassionate. So I, I think all of these work as we put these attitudes on. And so, you know, patience, a lot of times we think patience is something we do. And it's true. It, it could be that. But patience is more than that, isn't it? Patience is also more like an attitude, having the right kind of attitude. So Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 14, we urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, and be patient with everyone. Right? So uh, sometimes it's easier to be patient with the nice people, the kind people, the giving people, the serving people. Maybe it's easy for me to be patient with other people that are patient. But what about me being patient with people that are impatient? Those people that are nasty and they're mean. And they see, say things or do things that they shouldn't do. That are just, Like you call yourself a Christian. It's just not Christian to do that. So we can get impatient with people, right? Because they're not living the way they should. But we need to be patient with everyone. And you know that's hard. I know that's hard. Some people it's easy to be patient with. And sometimes, what does that have to do with it? Sometimes it has to do with a relationship. The people that I'm closer to, the people that I love, you know, maybe it's my own family members, that I am quicker to give them some slack, to give them a break, to kind of say, well, you know, they probably didn't mean it that way, or they're just having a bad day, or they're just struggling with something, or maybe that was my fault. Maybe I kind of irritated them a little bit, and that's why they're this way. But to be patient with everybody, that's even the people that maybe a little bit further away in our relationship. They're not quite that, in that inner circle or a close friend. And so to be patient with everyone, and that's what we're called to do. So Paul says this to Timothy as he is a preacher. So this may apply to preachers or to teachers or to elders or maybe even to, to teachers, right? A Bible class teacher or a parent. Because, you know, as a parent, you are trying to teach your children. So it says, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage. But you're, you're to be doing this kind of teaching. So again, think about whoever you're trying to teach or to lead or to influence for Christ. You do that with great patience. Because <laughs> if you're doing it impatiently, it kind of destroys the message, right? The messenger can, can kind of mess up the message if, you know, we're treating people very impatiently, right? That we come across like we're, we're angry. We come across like, well, you know, I can't wait anymore. I can't do this again. You know, you, we got to do this now. We got to make a decision now. Or what's taking you so long? Or why are you late again? You canceled again. Just, we can come across impatient. But he's saying, with great patience and careful instruction. So patience is important when we're leading people or teaching people or trying to influence people. Right? Because, again, we can have expectations. We can have a hope that, hey, it's, there's gonna, we're going to see some change soon. You ever felt like that with your own children? Kind of like, well, I've taught them, and I think they've got the lesson, and I'm sure they're going to be modifying their behavior anytime soon. But it's kind of like, wow, you know, it's just, it's just not happening. It's not happening as, as quickly as I thought it would happen. I mean, we've already talked about it. We discussed it. They agreed that, you know, they were going to change, and still not changing. So it's easy to become impatient. So the idea is, when we're teaching and leading, the best thing to do is do not become impatient. Now, is there time to correct and to discipline? Yeah, you do that without being impatient, right? Does that make sense? Like even Jesus, we could say Jesus got angry. The Bible says be angry and do not sin. But just because you're angry, it doesn't mean you're impatient. Your anger can still be under control. Your anger can still be done for, with a right attitude and even a right motive. Right? So it's not because you're impatient. It's simply because uh, you, you're trying to, this ins careful instruction, like, you know, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, you know, um, that uh, all scripture is inspired by God's prophet for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness. So, yeah, sometimes there has to be a firm um, discipline, but 
It is still done with this great patience and careful instruction. So that's kind of what we are called to do. In James chapter 5 and verse 7, now James is another one who's trying to correct a lot of issues and problems of pride and division and, and uh, people and their arrogant attitudes. He, he says, be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. So be patient until the Lord comes. Uh, it, it probably seems like some of the people then were saying, the Lord is coming soon. I hope he comes soon. And, and uh, you know, they could hardly wait. Now, some people got tired of waiting. And they said, you know, I don't, I don't think I'm going to follow Christ anymore. I, I think I'm just going to leave the church. I'm going to quit doing all this because I thought the Lord would have come by now. Now, Peter addresses that issue. The Lord's not slow in keeping his promise. So don't give up that the Lord's not here yet. He's not come. He's not redeemed us. He's not taken us to heaven. He's not fixed all the wrongs. He's not judged the world. None of that's happened yet. So be patient until the Lord's coming. And see how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and the spring rains. So it seems like he's saying there may be a lot of stuff going on, sometimes in the church, but sometimes in the world, and sometimes with Christians, and sometimes it's with non-Christians, but whatever the issue is, be patient for the Lord's coming. So what are we to do? We're to continue to be like the farmer. What does the farmer do? He plants seeds. So that's what we do. We try to plant the seeds of the kingdom, seeds of, uh, of service, seeds of love, seeds of the word, seeds of Christ. Uh, you know, so we plant seeds, but we ultimately leave it up to God because he's the one who's going to bring the rains, the autumn rains. He's the one who's going to make things grow. There's going to be a harvest eventually. There's going to be fruit and, and there's going to be uh, abundance eventually. But the farmer waits. Sometimes it has to wait a long time. He can't make it grow. He can just wait for it to grow. And so in that, he trusts God that God will continue to bring out the sun, that he'll continue to bring the rain, continue to, to make things grow so that we can have a harvest. So that's what the farmer does. He's saying we have to be like that as well. Be patient in waiting for the harvest. And the harvest hasn't yet come. So it does take patience. And it takes trust in God. And again, if we have those kinds of attitudes to say, you know, the whole thing is not finished yet. Life is not over yet. And so we need to continue to be faithful in trusting in God and saying, I'm just going to be patient and wait for him. And he's going to right all the wrongs. And he's going to provide salvation. Uh, he's going to fulfill the promises he's made so I can be patient and waiting for the Lord to return. And then 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you. And so the idea of this verse is, look how patient God is with us personally, with us as human beings on the earth, right? Even people that are not Christians. That's kind of what it's leaning towards here, that he, he's patient wanting people to become Christians, waiting for them to respond. So why has God not yet come? Because he's, he is patient. So you almost think, well, how hard is it for God to wait? You know, to wait for this judgment, to, to, to wait for the end of time. You know, you think that he'd be like, well, I could have done it a long time ago. Like thousands of years ago. Like, and again, it seems to be that's what the apostles were thinking in the first century, that Jesus Christ is coming like anytime soon. And they thought that the kingdom would come in their lifetime. It seems to be the way they write, that the, the Lord's coming is near. And, you know, we say, yeah, near is just kind of a, a, you know, a word that could mean just about anything. I don't think they were thinking near like 2,000 years near. I think they were thinking near. It's soon. Now, we could always be living saying it could be soon, it could be today, it could be tomorrow. We're always going to be ready for the Lord to come. But God is so patient. Why is that? Because he wants people to be saved. So if God's patient with us, if God's patient with other people, and if God is patient with that person at work, or the person on the road, or the person in your family, if God's patient with them, then we can be patient. I mean, we're trying to be like God. So we want to have those same kind of qualities that God has. So this is, uh, this is the verse in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12. This calls for patient endurance on the part of God's people, of God, who keeps his commands and remains faithful to Jesus. 
patient endurance to keep going. <laughs> See this guy in the picture? I kind of spent some time trying to find the right picture. Not that this is just the right one, but it's close. This guy may be very patient, right? I mean, he's not getting angry. He's not getting upset. He's not saying anything, but he's frustrated. And I think what patience is, is something on the inside. Like you can look at somebody and say, you know, I really disappointed them, but they were so patient. Because maybe they hit it really well. They weren't patient at all. Like they were so mad at you. Right? They were so upset, they were so angry, they were so frustrated, they were so impatient, but they were just able to say, oh, it's so good to see you, thank you so much for coming. Right? And so we think, oh, but patience is really an attitude of the inside that hopefully will come out. So when people say, you know, I was so angry, but I control my anger, now that's self-control. That's okay, that's a different issue, but it's not patience. Patience is on the inside where I say, I've got a different attitude towards people. And maybe that's part of the thing. Jesus knew that sometimes people are going to be late. And so when they're late, you don't have to get so upset that some people are just not going to show up and they don't even call or text. Jesus went through that, I'm sure. Okay, do I need to get a sign that says laugh now or something? Anyway, all right. You know, but, but Jesus was disappointed a lot in people, right? But he still had patience with people. Like you, because it came from the inside and, and it showed up in the way he talked. It showed up in his facial expressions. It showed up in his service. It showed up in just the way he treated people because that was an attitude he had of the heart. So this idea of no matter what happens, and this is what Revelation is written about, People that are going to be going through some suffering for being Christians, and the suffering had already started to some degree, but it was going to get a lot worse. But he's saying, this calls for patient endurance. This, this, this persecution and these trials and the difficulties that are going to come because you're a Christian, this time calls for patient endurance on a part of God's people. And that's what we need today as well. This idea of continuing to say, I'm going to have the right attitude and hopefully that will show in my actions and in my words and the way I treat people uh, with this kind of patience. So we know that God is patient. We're thankful for that. Certainly even as a Christian. You know, I'm thankful that God waited so that I could become a Christian. But since I've become a Christian, I'm also very thankful that God is patient. Because I'm sure I have tried his patience. You ever heard that before, you know, that, you know, I'm sure I've gotten on his last nerve, but he, he still continues to love. He still continues to be kind and gentle and patient. He still waits for us and waits for me to respond and to turn back to him and to seek him again and, and, and confess, to repent. He, he's so, so faithful and so kind, and yet he's so just. So I'm thankful for God's patience, and if God is really like that with you, then maybe that would help us to have more patience with other people. Because we realize we need forgiveness for all the times that we've put other people in the place where, yeah, my parents should have been impatient with me a lot more than they were, or, you know, my family members, or my friends, or my wife, you know what I mean? Patient. People are patient with me, so I need to learn how to be patient. A better attitude. The attitude of patience, not just the actions of patience. So we're thankful that God is patient and that he's kind and he's loving. So we encourage you to be patient. And if we can encourage you in your Christian walk today uh, to be faithful or to pray for you or to, to be a blessing to you. Let's stand, we'll sing this song, and let us know how we can be an encouragement.